Hey everyone, thank you so much for coming out and checking out my presentation today. I am Angie Ferret. I work as an FUI motion designer at Scarab, and I also teach 3D fundamentals using Cinema 4D at VFS, Vancouver Film School, both of which are in Vancouver, Canada, um, Hollywood North. At Scarab, I work as a team to create FUI and playback, as well as some VFX, uh, primarily in my favorite universe, the DC universe. So let's take a look at some of Scarab's work. Yay! So that's Scarab on um, a lot of shows like Supergirl, The Flash, Arrow, and most recently Batwoman, which I will show you a project from coming up. Uh, but first I want to show you a project that I worked on, a little project called Sonic the Hedgehog. So I'll show you a clip from that film and explain a little bit afterwards. Agent Stone? Doctor. Do you see anything useful in this image? Nothing at all, Doctor. Of course you don't. Your eyes weren't expertly trained to spot tracks by the Native American shadow wolves. That's extraordinary. No. What's extraordinary is... I've determined the exact height, weight, and spinal curvature of this creature, and my computer can't find a single match for it anywhere in Earth's animal kingdom. This blackout was not a terrorist attack, and that's no baby Bigfoot. This guy is something else entirely. Divert all search units to the site of the footprint. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for me. Gotta love Jim Carrey. 
And myself in particular, I worked on, open that back up, these pads that Dr. Robotnik is, is touching. So any of those gestures, he's an evil genius, so didn't really have to understand exactly what he was doing. But we wanted to tell a story with those pads because he has a lot of a lot of gestures all at once. He touches things and move thing, moves things around. So I want to really walk you through the development of that scene. So it started off, another designer that I worked with named Jer, he kind of did a lot of the broad strokes for many, many of the shots on this film. And then those got handed off to us. So once he kind of nailed down possibly what the client was was going for, then I took it and threw a bit more paint on the canvas, so to speak. So first off, super broad strokes, just getting in some basic shapes, nailing down the hand movements. Um, and then the state that I got it in was more like this. So initially they had wanted something more holographic. So these shapes coming up from within the iPad, again, very broad strokes, just uh, at this stage, it's very rudimentary shapes and just getting down what it could possibly look like, um, particularly over here on the left pad. And then from there, I did a little bit of just pulling images and, and slapping them in to just get a feel for what might possibly stick. So just super quick and dirty, throwing things in there to see what it could possibly look like. Um, the one that was fairly well received and which I, I liked was this idea of having this reactive mesh. So when Dr. Robotnik would touch the pads, the mesh would kind of react to where he would touch and do this kind of like warble and, and then decay. So I know there's a lot going on in here, but again, kind of just throwing things at at the canvas and seeing what would stick in these fairly broad strokes and, and then kind of subtracting or adding as, as I went along. So I want to show you how I set up that scene. So I'm going to jump into cinema. And the first thing we're going to do is we're going to calibrate a camera so that we can get some objects in that scene that naturally look like they belong there. And it's fairly quick and easy to do with cinema. It's super awesome. So to start out, I'm going to create a camera. And then we're going to add a tag to it. So I'm going to come down to my tracker tags. And the tag I'm looking for is my camera calibrator. We can add that. And then over here in my image tab, this is where I can add just a still image from that scene. So I just exported a single frame, which is this one here. And I'm going to just make sure that I set my scene size so that it matches my plates, my original footage. So I know that this one is 3840 by 2160. There we go. So now that matches. And now I'm going to go in and start actually calibrating this camera. So. To do this, what I want to do is I want to make sure that I'm in my calibrate tab down here in my attributes for this tag, for the camera calibrator tag. And we can do a couple of things. So I'm going to do a combination of adding some lines and also adding a grid. And as we do that, we'll notice that these little switches will turn from either from red to either yellow or green. And uh, we'll take a look at that as we go. So. To start off, I'm going to add a line. So you can see that this line is now added to our scene. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to make sure that I uh, line these up with some straight edges. So if you ever took art class, if you remember doing your vanishing point, it's kind of what we're looking for here. You can see that we have the X, Y, and Z vanishing points. So when you have that lined up, uh, as you drag these points, uh, kind of like vertices, you'll get this little zoomed in box with this crosshatch on it. So that just really lets you zoom in and focus on the particular area. So when you have your line set up, in order to change 
the axis that that line is associated with, we want to shift and click on that line. So right now I've turned it red, so that corresponds with my X axis. If I click it again, we'll go to Y, and then again will be Z. So the colors just correspond with whatever axis you're on. So for this one, I want my X axis, so I'm going to turn that back to red. And I'll add a second line, and I'm going to do the same thing down here for the front edge of the desk. I'm not going to worry too much about the vanishing point for the rest of this shot because we're really just, we want to calibrate the front here for these two pads. So I'll go in, line this up with the edge, line it up with this edge, and then again, shift click to turn it red. Uh, you can see that this shot was done in a fairly wide angle lens, so it's not going to line up perfectly with the front edge here. Uh, so right now we're seeing that the, the X vanishing point is partially solved. So yellow is kind of like a best guess. We'll add a couple more lines and we should see some more of these uh, becoming active. So I'm going to go in and, and change this line, um, add this line and change it to be my Z axis. So I'm going to line it up with this part of the desk. I could also have done this part, but this part will work fine. There we go. And then I'm going to shift click to turn that blue. And I'll add one more on the other side. And you can always go in if you're not getting the perfect result, you might just need to go in and readjust those lines afterward. There we go. So now we can see that it has solved for my camera focal length and camera orientation. And it's done a, its best guess to, to guess the vanishing points. I'm going to add one more vertical line. It's going to use this edge here. So obviously this works really well if you have some type of straight line lines or edges if you're doing an image that doesn't have those then it obviously it's going to be super hard to find to solve for these so i'll just shift click again and i'll turn that one green for my y-axis so we still have a bit of uncertainty here uh, something else that we can do is add this grid so i'm going to click in and add this grid and i'm going to line this up directly with the edges of these pads. There we go. And then very similar, I'm just going to shift click so that the um, X axis turns red and then shift click on the side here. Oops. There we go. Shift click on the side there. Uh, until it turns blue. So it's still a little uncertain in my X and Y axis. I'm just going to make sure that I have this lined up exactly. There we go. So just had to make a little adjustment to make sure that this was exactly in line. And now we have all green buttons, which is what I'd like to see. Um, great. So next thing we're going to do is we're going to calibrate for the camera position. So in order to do this, I'm going to make sure that I'm looking through my camera. So I'm just clicking on this little switch so I know that I'm, I'm looking through my camera. And I'm going to add a pin. So we get this little orange circle. And what this does is this is where whenever we add objects to our scene, it's going to use this pin to add as our, as our main position. So I'm going to be working mainly on this left side pad. So I'm going to add this pin to the edge of my, my grid over here. So camera position is the assumed distance. I'm going to say that that's good enough uh, for my purposes. So now if I add in a plane, we should see that it adds it to the edge um, where that pin has been added. So one more step, just so I can see my scene as well as my objects at the same time, I'm going to add a background in here. 
not a floor. Hold down to add a background object. And then I'm going to quickly make a material that just contains a video of my plate. So I have this MP4 of my main uh, plate there, which is basically just Dr. Robotnik touching the pads. Click open and yes. And one thing you'll want to make sure that you have done so that we can see the actual video playing is if you come down here to edit and then click on animate preview, this way it won't look like a still. We'll actually be able to see the animation or the video file um, and what Dr. Robotnik's hands are doing, which is pretty important to us at this point because he's touching things very quickly and we want to make sure that we're nailing those cues. Um, so I'm just going to add this material onto my background. <clears throat> there we go. So now we can see that this pad is pretty much where it needs to be, um, or the plane rather. So I'm just going to scale this down. And just move it into place. There we go. So right now I'm just going to quickly save this. So I want to show you how I used After Effects as well to do some really quick iterations of this project, um, bringing it in using Cineware. And that just allowed me to like really quickly add some effects onto this and, you know, render it out and send it off to client and just kind of get their gauge. So things were happening nice and quickly. Um, so I'm going to save this into my Sonic folder. And I'll just call this Sonic 01. Hit save. And I'm going to open up my After Effects. And I'll just open up the project as well. So I have a couple of things going on in the actual project file. So I have these two kind of mirror boxes that I've built. So it looks like there's kind of depth within each pad, the left and the right side. And then just some quick rotos uh, that I did just basically for development. So you can see where his hands are over top of the pads. So I'm going to bring in that cinema file that I just created. Just drag that right into my project. And make sure I put that in the correct folder. And it's basically that easy. So you can just bring in a cinema file and it automatically talks to cinema using Cineware. It's amazing. Um, so I'm going to click on my Cinema 4D file. And in order to see what's actually happening in our scene, rather than having the software shading or software render, I'm going to go to my standard and final. So anytime that I make any changes now in After Effects and hit save, we'll see that reflected in that After Effects file. So let's add, start adding that mesh warping, um, warbly effect that we had going on. So I'm going to click on my plane and I'm just going to add some more segments. So maybe around 25 and 25 in, in both fields here. And then in my plane, I'm going to go to my effectors and I'm going to add a formula. So I'm going to put that underneath my plane. So right away, we're going to see it affecting the whole plane. Obviously not what we're after. I'm going to make the bounding box of this kind of just encompassing that plane that we created. Go into my four view. Drag that over. There we go. 
All right, great. So it, it's already looking a little bit more like what the example that I showed you looked like. Um, in order to really isolate his movements, I'm going to go into my formula and in my fall off tab, I'm going to add a torus field. It'll come in being super huge like this. So I'm just going to make some adjustments to that actual torus. I'll just scale this down. I'm just going to exit my camera for a moment and zoom in a bit on this. So you can already see what's happening as I, as I move this torus over the plane. It's just affecting the plane wherever the torus is touching it, which is great. So this is, this is what we want. Um, one thing that will happen, though, if I press play, we can see that it's just affecting it universally, so across my timeline. Instead of having this happen, we just want to isolate a couple of frames when Dr. Robotnik's finger actually touches the, the pad. I'll go back into my camera and I'm just going to turn off my plane for a moment so I can see his hand gestures. So let's add the one where he kind of touches a bit further up on the pad right here, around 15 frames. I'll turn that plane back on. I'm going to scale the torus down just a little bit more. And all I'm going to do is I'm just going to animate the strength of the formula on this torus. So if I go into the torus, into the remapping tab down here in my attributes menu, um, we can see that the strength is automatically set to 100. So I'm just going to animate that property. So I know at 15 frames, I want the strength to be at 100. So as if he's actually touching it. And then I'm just going to go back a couple frames, set that to zero, set another one and go ahead a little bit and the same thing, maybe just a couple of frames, set that to zero and then click to set another keyframe. So we should just see a quick little like bloop where he, where he touches the pads. Let me just exit the camera again. There we go. So obviously that doesn't look super realistic because it's, it's kind of going away too quickly. What we can do is we can just add an effect to the actual um, formula here. So we come down here where it says clamp. I'm going to add this decay. So by default, it's set to 50, but that should even look a little bit better. So rather than just kind of shutting off, this is more like he touched it and then it naturally kind of just fades away. I'm going to turn it up a little more. Maybe around like 70-ish. So it just takes a little bit longer to go away. So yeah, that's looking kind of cool. More like a wave. Go back into my camera. I'm going to just hit Command S to save this. And just want to make sure that I, I position this underneath his finger there. So just turning off that plane for a moment. I'll move my torus over, turn the plane back on. And the last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go into my render settings and I only want the lines and edges of that plane. So I'm going to add a cell renderer effect. So effects cell renderer. And I'm going to make sure I turn on the edges because I want both the outline and the edges. And then I'm going to turn the background black. And then the edges I'll make Kind of like this bright blue. So in After Effects, we can add a blending mode and it'll take away the black and we'll only see the blue lines. So I'll just render this in my viewport, see what that looks like. Yeah, that's that looks pretty, pretty close, pretty cool, actually. So I'll just hit save again and I'll go back into After Effects and we should see that update. If we move ahead to where his fingers are touching the pads. Then we can see that happening in real time. So that's really it. Um, we can add a blending mode in here, as I said, maybe something like overlay. And we still get that depth of the, uh, that kind of like mirror box that I was talking about. And yeah, so anything you change, all your iterations, you can just render right out of After Effects. You don't have to worry about pre-rendering. It's really quick. It's a really quick work workflow. I really, 
loved working on this project in this way. Great. So I want to show you a second villain project. So in Gotham, hide all this. In Gotham, we have a hacker. So let me show you the clip from that. It intercepts and jumbles traffic as it passes over a digital network. The hacker probably used it to hijack the train's brakes remotely. I love to dig, because when I dig, I find all the secrets you bury. Did you just get the same thing? If I can hack your subway, I can hack your phone, computer, home security cameras. Did I get your attention? Good. Now crowdfund my escape from Gotham. Click the link and help me raise $5 million by midnight on Friday where your secrets come out. Doesn't matter if you're a porn addict, master vigilante, or everyday Joe Schmo. Pay up, Gotham! Awesome. So yeah, as I mentioned, we do a lot of screen-based FUI. So anytime you see a phone or a TV, that's us. Um, so in this one, the hacker's taking over Gotham and everyone's devices are being overtaken. So everyone's seeing this cute little terrier head um, on their TVs and on their phones. And I just, I, I just love it so much. So let's show, let me show you how I... Um, how I created this project. Huge thank you to Maxon for creating Moves by Maxon. Um, originally, when I created this project, I used CVAR, which was just for facial mo motion capture. And since then, they have rolled it all into Moves by Maxon. So you get the facial motion capture as well as the body motion capture using your iPhone 10. I'll show you how I set that up. So I'll just create a new scene here. So if you once you have Moose by Maxon installed, you'll find that up here in your extensions. And down here I have Moose by Maxon. The first time you open this, you'll have to open the app on your phone and scan this QR code and then immediately all of the videos that you've taken will be populated in here. And then you'll have the option to download them, um, which I've already done. But when you click on download, it will just open up a folder, which is where it's going to download all of your, your videos to. Uh, so make sure you just pay attention to where you're putting those. And then once they're in here, you can just choose whichever one you want and click on add to scene. There we go. And then once it's in there, I can see the, the little dog head over here. Uh, so just a note as well, any, anything that you name it on your phone is what's going to show up populated in here. So just make sure you're paying attention to naming conventions as well. So in our scene, I can see we have our face capture object here. So it's called dog head. And then under that, we have the actual mesh. So I'm going to click on the mesh and hit O on my keyboard just to center that in, in the frame here. So I started my recording, I was just sitting on my couch. So that's why we're kind of seeing the wall in the background. But if I scrub ahead, we'll see my face. It then finds my face. So my face pops into the, the object here, the mask looking object. So if I select my motion capture, um, sorry, face capture object here, we get some settings underneath of what we want to do. So immediately, I usually click on set timeline to face count because right now it's still at the default 90 frames. So if I click that, we'll see that I recorded 948 frames in that particular performance. And the next thing I usually do is I will add some eyes just because it kind of creeps me out without eyes. So I'll click add eyes and it's already looking a little bit more like me. Except I have blue eyes, so we can see that since I added that uh, that eye um, those, that eye option, we get a material down here. So I can double click on the material, and if I go into the color channel, we have this gradient that creates the actual color of the eye. So let's make those blue, bluish gray. There we go. So that looks a bit more like me. Okay, so let's take a look at what is going on 
with this data here. So if I click on my face capture object here, and we come over to my blend shapes, we can see that all of this data has been recorded. So my right eye blink, um, jaw, forward, left, um, all of these mouth shapes are created. Um, where I have my eyebrows, my cheeks, my nose, and even my tongue. So in this, in this performance, I, I stuck my tongue out a couple times as well because there's some some parts of the the animation that I showed you that have the dog's tongue kind of sticking out like he's just panting. So we're going to use all of this information, not all of it, we're going to choose what part of the information we want to actually put onto our, our rigged character that we have. So let's bring in that character. I'm just going to come up to File and Merge Project and then find my dog rig here and bring that in. As you can see, this um, terrier character came in super, super small. So one thing you want to make sure that you do is you want to have a similar size between both objects. Uh, in particular, you want to scale your character object up to match your performance. It's just going to make things look more correct and match up. Um, when you actually use the data between the two. So I'm going to just collapse this. Yeah, so I'll grab the main null here and I'm going to make sure that I'm in object mode because otherwise it's going to scale up parts of this thing all wonky and I don't want that. So make sure you're in object mode, otherwise it'll look like it exploded. Um, I'm going to choose my scale tool and I'll just scale this terrier way up and let's see maybe a little bit more just so it's kind of similar there we go so now i'm just going to move it over so it's beside my face there we go okay so we have the two objects in here. I have this rig, so we have all of these controls, um, each of the eyes, even these little hair pieces if I wanted to move those, uh, which for this I don't. Um, the jaw, so if I want to rotate the jaw open, all of these controls are already pre-rigged. So you'll have to have a character that's already rigged or you'll have to rig it uh, and then bring it in. Now what we're going to do is we're going to do a do a set driven set driver and use some nodes and connect how these two are communicating. Um, so first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to put a pose morph tag on my dog object. So if I come up to tags and go to rigging and choose pose morph here, that adds a tag onto our main null. And in here, I want to tell it that I'm going to manipulate a couple of these properties. So position, scale, rotation, and hierarchy are what I want to enable. So if I click on one, it's going to automatically jump over to the other tag and just be like, hey, just so you're aware, um, we have these poses here. So we have a base pose, which is the resting face. And then it generates this pose zero. So this one we can make changes on. But first, I want to pop back into that basic tag and just make sure that I click on all of those uh, properties that I want it. And then I can click back over to my tag and, and make these changes. So for the first one here, I'm going to double click to rename it. I'll just call this jaw. And then to add extra poses, um, we can just use this add pose button down here. So for this one, I'm going to add a couple more. So I'll add blink. I will add tongue. And what else? Jaw, blink, tongue, and eyebrows. There we go. So yeah. 
Um, but like I said, you can, if you wanted to animate the nose or the ears or the hair, whatever you wanted to, we saw all of those options that we had. So on these poses, what we want to do is we want to make sure that we set what is happening to them. So if I click on my jaw, now I, I want to make sure that I go and find my jaw control and then I'm going to set it, set the animation kind of at the maximum of where I want it. So I'll just rotate the jaw open. And if I go back to my pose morphs, now I can switch between my base pose and my jaw pose. And we can see that my jaw is opening how I want it to. And we're just going to do the same for the other one. So if I come over to my blink, I'm going to find my eye controls here. And I'm just going to scale the eyes so they look like they're blinking. So you can do whatever you want for these. If you wanted, when I blink for one of my eyes to kind of shoot off to the right, you can do that. I don't know why you would, but it's an option. So for these, I'm just going to scale them. Again, if I go back to my pose morph tag, I can see what's happening between those. And then I'll do the eyebrows next. Find my eyebrows. So I'm just going to shift click both of these and move them up and maybe rotate them individually. It's up to you, however you want to animate this. And then my last one, so I'll go back to my pose morph tag again. And then the last one is the tongue. So for this one, I want to make sure that I rotate the jaw open as well as sticking the tongue out. So I'm going to find my jaw again. Rotate this open. And then find my Oh, it's underneath the jaw. I'm just going to command click to show everything underneath. So there's a bunch of tongue controls. There's all of these little dots are the controls on this tongue. So I'm going to go to the main one up here and just move that out a bit. Actually, I'm going to undo that because I don't want to move the entire tongue, maybe the second part. Maybe just this part, just kind of like stretch it out and rotate it down a little bit. And then I'll go kind of closer to the end and rotate that down a bit. Yeah, that looks pretty good. So now if I go back to my pose morph tag, we can see that we have all of those working. Awesome. Okay, so now what we want to do is we want to do a set driver set driven. So we're going to take the data from our face capture object and then use it to drive this animation. So in order to do that, I'm just going to collapse all of this. I'll go back into my blend shapes and then I'll choose the jaw open first. So I'm going to right click on this. I'm going to come up to expressions and then I'm going to do a set driver. And then I'm going to click on my pose morph tag and I have to make sure that I click on animate. So now we can see all of our, our poses at once. And then this is where we're going to set our driven from. So if I right click on my jaw, and go back to expressions again and go to set driven. So now we can see if I scrub through that uh, the jaw is working. So we'll see the other ones also at maximum because um, we haven't set them yet. And in order to set these up, if I double click on this expresso tag that's been added to our, our dog information here, our dog null, we'll see these nodes. So we have the set driver and then set driven and then a range mapper in the middle. Um, so we can just expand these and add the rest of our parameters into these that are already created. So I'll just drag those out. And then from, uh, from here, we can just drag whatever items we want 
onto those null, onto those uh, nodes. So for this, I'm just going to use one of the eyes to drive both of the eyes. So I can grab this left blink eye, and I'm just going to drag it onto the edge here, and we'll see that it, it populates in there. Um, so we want the eyes, we want the jaw we have already, uh, we want the eyebrows. I'll do brow up left, and then for the tongue, I'll drag that in. Um, Awesome, so then for the other side, we're gonna do the same thing. So we'll go into our pose morph tag, and then from here we can just drag in <clears throat> these items. So blink, tongue, eyebrows, and I'm just gonna reorder these so that they match. And then for the range mapper, we will have to copy and paste. So I'm just gonna hit Control C, Control V, and then I'm just gonna connect these little nodes. So we go have the in and the out results. I'm going to copy it again. And once more. There we go. So now if I hit play, we should see the performances matching. And that looks Right, awesome. And a couple finishing touches here. So I'm just gonna quickly add a physical sky. So this is a little cheat. I use this to light my scenes quite, a, quite often. Um, just some really nice natural light and it's a really quick and easy thing to do. So if I click on my physical sky and come over to my time and location, maybe I'll make this like 10 a.m. So the lighting is a little less harsh, less bright. And then I'm gonna put a compositing tag on this. So I'm gonna right click and go to um, render tags and add a compositing tag. And then in here, I'm just gonna turn off scene by camera. So we only have the effects of the light and we don't have the actual um, sky image in the background because I wanna composite this onto what looks like a text message. So we need the transparency in the background. Um, and if Let's take a look at this. I think the shadows are probably a bit harsh. Um, so I'm going to actually turn off my um, face capture uh, object because we don't need that anymore. We don't need to see it, uh, but we will need it in the scene. And then I'm going to just center my object. There we go. center of my scene there. Okay, and last thing I'm gonna do, I wanna add some of this geometry uh, into a subdiv uh, subdivision surface. And so I'll put the eyes in there, in there. I'm um, just looking a little bit jagged. And then I'm gonna put the face into one as well. So if you hold Alt when you have it selected, it will just um, add it directly into it. So just so it's a little bit more smooth out. And then I just want to render it out. So I won't do that. I've already pre-rendered this, so it won't make you wait through a render. But um, then I will bring it into After Effects. I'll just show you quickly how this scene is kind of set up. So for this, we needed a couple of cue points. We wanted it to start off on the phone uh, as if a text message had came in, and then give the option for uh, the operators to queue it for the actual message to then pop up with some sparkles. And then in here, I just added a couple of things. Um, I added a bit of wiggle to the head and did a little bit of um, a little bit of color correction on it, but nothing too crazy. So it looked pretty good coming directly out of cinema and yeah, that's really it. So that's how our hacker villain was able to take over Gotham City and hold it for ransom. Um, thank you again so much for joining me. I'll just... So my personal website is angieferret.com. On social media, you can follow me at, at angieferret. And then scarabdigital.com is the place that I work at. You can check out our work there. 
And then if you're interested at all in where I teach, that's at vfs.edu. Again, thank you so much.